when doing digital pathology, shall you do it in incremental steps and check if it's going to work for you? Or shall you go all in and reap the benefits all the aspects of digital pathology can give you? In ideal world, if it was not associated with a big cost, you would go all in and reap the benefits as fast as you can. But in the real world, you probably have to start small. There is a solution to that. There are companies you can partner with so that you can start small, but take advantage of the full infrastructure. And in this episode, I'm going to be showcasing a company like that, Trimetis Life Sciences. Learn about the newest digital pathology trends in science and industry meet the most interesting people in the niche, and gain insights relevant to your own projects. Here is where pathology meets computer science. You are listening to the Digital Pathology Podcast with your host, Dr. Alexandra Zhurov. Usually when I talk to digital pathology companies, they focus on one digital pathology component, maybe scanning, maybe image analysis, maybe image management system, maybe lab automation, maybe partnering with labs. This company is doing it all and is being an external hub for everyone who wants to start doing digital pathology but does not have all the components. It's a really unique value proposition and my guest Leif Hoda is going to talk about it in this episode. Welcome to the podcast, my digital pathology trailblazers. Today, my guest is Leif Honda. He's the chief innovation officer at Trimetis Life Sciences. And Trimetis Life Sciences is an interesting company that I wanted to present on the podcast. I let Leif introduce himself and the company. But just to give you an initial perspective, Trimetis used to be a biobank and now they're serving other biobanks with digital pathology and AI. Leif, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? Thank you. Thank you, Alex. I'm well. It's nice to see you again. Great to see you as well. We start with you. Tell our trailblazers. I call my people digital pathology trailblazers, and you belong to this club as well by being on this podcast and driving this innovation. And you especially because you're chief innovation officer. Not every company has that position. So go ahead and tell us about yourself. Yeah, that's correct. I'm the chief innovation officer at Trimetis. And uh, yeah, that role is a very interesting one. It's one that uh, came about over a period of years where I've been tasked with finding new innovations that will help our biobanking and future processes with supporting pharma and diagnostic companies. Who are you? What's your background? How did you end up in Trimetis? I have a molecular biology and economics degrees. And for years... That's a rare combination, Leif. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's actually difficult to get my school it really didn't support that. But I did get finally get the, both degrees at the same time. And that combination really comes from a place where I had been looking at into medicine and was going to go to medical school and found a very interesting crossover when I took an economics course and realized that these two are kind of ivory towers. They separate very early on and say, you study very hard in chemistry and biology and sciences and there do you think about what it costs and how to do things. And so I was really intrigued by that and underpinned my future by trying to get these two degrees simultaneously and combine them. And then as molecular biology emerged as something of more import in sciences, it really showed we're pretty inefficient in the medical system as well as in the research area. And over a period of years, I've been working in life sciences and finance, essentially, and funding these companies. And then I was picked up by a gentleman who was running Olympus America and had retired for one day and decided that he wanted to use his money that accumulated into investing in companies. After one day of retirement. Yeah, he's that kind of guy. He's a (laughs) great person, Sidney Briansky. And uh, he really taught me a lot about the business of life sciences. And he, the first investment was in FTIR, Fourier Transfer Infrared Technology, which is used in the heat seeking missiles and foodstuffs and growing computer boards and things like that. And so we were very successful in that business and eventually flipped that business. From there, he reinvested in a company that was really in a subset of proteomics, which is called peptidomics. And that's Mm -hmm. where the genesis of all this kind of innovation came from is how do you use visible light and different wavelengths? 
companies the light to identify new analytes, new targets, new biomarkers in disease. We had invested in a very exceptional company out of Germany that had been around for 20 years, really cutting edge. And when I got in there, I realized like we have a lot of scientists and we have no business whatsoever. So we had a problem, problem to deal with. And so he sent me in there to change that. And it wasn't about right sizing it or downsizing or anything like that. It was about how do you get all this great research into the world? How do you put the marketing material around it? But also, how do you get it to validate? And that's where the impetus for me came from is I started saying, well, these programs are exceptional. And some of these programs are just emerging today, to be honest with you. Some of the Alzheimer's programs we were doing that science was already done 20 years ago, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, a certain markers of breast cancer, and even things that are emerging today, which are you know, diabetes drugs, type 2 diabetes drugs, now are fashionable use for weight loss. We had discovered all that already, but we couldn't prove it because we didn't have the samples and the tissue to get it. And we were on a hospital campus in Germany, but we still couldn't get those tissues. And so that's where this journey began. And I had uh, of getting the tissues, right? Getting the tissues. Yep. So working with the doctors, the phlebotomists, everyone involved to get tissues and images. Even when you're doing diabetes, you need to have images. When you're looking at the kidneys. When you're looking at cancer, you need to have images. And that just wasn't mature yet. That was very difficult to get. And that's where the journey started. At how do we make this better? Because this can't be just our problem. And it turns out it's everybody's problem that a lot of studies are delayed or waylaid because they don't have samples to do discovery on or validation on or verification or what have you along that process. So you think about why it takes 12 years to get a new diagnostic out there. Why does it take more than that to get a new therapy out there? And although we're doing better with AI and different technologies now, we're still taking a long time to get new therapeutics. And the disease book is big as just pathologists. It's massive. So I that was where we started. And I said, I think we can solve for this. I think we can fix this and get forward in our own programs, accelerate this process. So I'm going to ask you in a second about the biobanking workflow, because this is not a standard digital pathology application or startup, but I want to emphasize what you just said. And I see a trend in recently in my podcast guests that they are a personification of some kind of bridge, bridging two disciplines. And you said that you had this company that had so much great research, but there was no business. And I don't know if it's in other disciplines as well, but somehow like the academia is a little bit like with an antagonistic attitude towards commercial business where to drive this thing forward, the money has to be behind it. Like you can invent whatever you want in the academia. If it doesn't make it to people and it doesn't benefit, doesn't provide value, money is never going to follow. You can apply for millions of grants. That's going to be your only money you ever have gotten. And this researcher is going to just be stuck in papers. So I've been promoting a lot of open source software, but now I also want to, because digital pathology is the academia, it's the practitioners, and it's the vendors as well. Because mm -hmm. you guys as vendors, regardless in which area of digital pathology, you are those who are taking the hit from all the clients. And your job is to actually incorporate this feedback, right? Yeah. about everything that's not working perfectly, and it's not going to be, and you take it and you make a viable business and you provide enough value so that people follow with their money. And I think this is something that should be emphasized more, that we should work together. And that's why I love the startups that stem from academia and then decide to become a business. So that's one thing. And I very much salute you for that. And the other thing is, tell us about biobanking, just like a bird's eye view about biobanking. You already mentioned, okay, research is slow because there are no samples. So there are biobanks with sample. What's the workflow? Where do those samples come from? Who mm -hmm. needs them in general? And then how do you assess those samples regarding quality? Which do you want first? The first question Let's or the second do, question? Where do they come from? Where do the samples come they? from okay. for, uh, in biobanks? As you can imagine for biobanking, the biobanking piece is really just the repository and inventory of the samples that are collected, but they come from all over. And each culture, each society has a different way of thinking about the human body and the materials that come out of the human body. So in many cases, you want to have a consented sample, one that is ethically consented. You know it's not going to be misused, that it's fit for purpose, and you have to go through this process. But the samples can come from anywhere because 
it's along the what we would call the patient continuum. Right? The minute that it's identified even before that, understanding pre-disease, into disease, and then following it. And so that involves a lot of different practitioners. It involves a pathologist, obviously, but before that, it's your general practitioner. Then it's maybe a subspecialist into oncology, and the pathologist has a look. But then if it's, if it's dermatopathology, then it involves them. Then there's the laboratory that has supporting with the testing. So you could have anywhere from just regular CBCs and normal body bodily function tests that go to a lab core, for example, or you can have genomic testing that goes to foundation medicine or standard biomarker testing using IHC, immunistic chemistry. You know, so there's so many different elements to it that are supporting this process. You include clinical trials in that too. There are clinical trial pathways that involve those doctors. And so that's what makes it the most comp one of the most complicated things. And a lot of people ignore the fact that it's really important, but it's super complicated because you have to involve all these people and say, this consent travels to this doctor and who owns that material and is that material then allowed to be used in research and what are the applications most of our ethics are around in biobanking around using the material but not making a commercial product out of it so you can't always just take cells from a cancer and regenerate those and then sell them for profit you have to have a fit for purpose of, uh, approval so that's one pathway. The other pathway is after they've been processed and the patient doesn't need that material, then you can go for a waiver of consent, which is essentially saying this material is going into the garbage or it's being stored for long-term use by a responsible party. And then you can get those samples. But those are then all put into different things. So biofluids could be frozen into subsets of whole blood pellets and serum and plasma, for example. We have whole bloods that are going fresh to locations within 20 hours so that they can be processed in the circulating tumor cells and identified in that. We have the pathology blocks and slides that are going to other people to be stained and retested. And then we have a number of other frozen and other products that come from the human body, including any bodily fluid, essentially, and any solid tissue. And what makes it difficult for a lot of things is that we know enough about the solid tumor tissue to know that we need to know what happened before and after in order to say, was there a change? And that becomes mm -hmm. difficult because that's not standard of care necessary. You don't always get a biopsy before you have surgery, for example, and they identify, a pathologist looks at it, says, yes, you have cancer. Then they may hit it with a adjuvant therapy or some therapy and initial to shrink it and start attacking the cancer. And then you have the resection, but you may not have a subsequent biopsy because they say, well, we removed that tissue. And mm -hmm. so that we really have to weave these parts together for pharma and to say, to get access for them to do these things. And so it's a labor of love and there aren't that many people do it because it is so complicated. It, it requires, sometimes it requires academia because of the way things, or like in the UK, it's a socialized system, which is great, but they buy things differently. They have different pathways. Mm -hmm. Or in the United States, we have privatized system oncologists groups that have nothing to do with the hospital and they're completely disparate. And so they're working together, but they really aren't under one control. So it becomes very difficult from a legal perspective. So that is the impetus of the biobank is like, how do you get access to the tissue? And then it's stored in the biobanks. Once it's in there, one of the problems is it's in there. If you don't annotate it properly, if you don't know what's in there, you don't know what's in there again. And then when it comes out, it has to be rechecked. And so it may need to be retested completely. And so it goes through that whole process again. And that's where we we, we had been working on this for years with protocols and SOPs and training people saying, here's how you handle the sample. Here's how you consent the patient. Here's how you handle the sample. Here's how you session the sample. Here's what data needs to go with that sample and very meticulously orchestrating that. But that is very labor intensive and it's not the priority of those people that are providing the care. Their first priority is the patient and then maybe subsequent to that, it's maybe a clinical trial and then research. And so we're the third mm -hmm. person, if not the fourth person in line. We have to be very thorough in this process and what goes in you may not know what's in there after a while and over the years you kind of lose track of that and you also as those materials age they lose relevancy right so you don't know if there's a new marker out for example if it's KRAS or EGFR or ALP or an immunotherapy those markers are new so they're only in the new generation of tissues and they're immediately so they're newly uh, expressed and they're newly, newly expressed. discovered yeah so it's already becoming older and less valuable to the researcher because it's now it doesn't have the information so that's the where that inflection point we have been waiting for years thinking about how can we do this better we 
talk to all our clients and say, how do we do this better? And a lot of them say, we don't know how you do it. We'll share our manual with you. We'll share our SOPs with you. And they're like, that's just the way it's always been done. And that's the most common answer. So in the biobank, we have biobanks. We partner with biobanks. It's a great way to get tissue that isn't required to be fresh necessarily. But again, it becomes this kind of nightmare scenario where you can have lots and lots of samples that are frozen in time information wise. And what we want to do as business people is we want to turn that inventory over. And that means working with all types of people, academics, government, pharma, diagnostics, whatever the case may be, consortiums. We want to turn that inventory over. And a lot of them just host that inventory and it never comes out again because it's so much effort to get it in there. And then forget about the part which the researchers have access to it. They can do more with it. The more yeah, information. What it the was there. collected for in the first place. Yeah, Definitely exactly. not to have a great repository that sits there. <laughs> Because yeah. then the value depreciates with every week that it's stored there. So I heard about you from a fellow podcaster from Dennis Strang, who yeah. has the People of Pathology podcast. And he always gives me hints who's a cool person to interview about digital pathology that he's interviewing. So I would love to hear the story from you, how you guys pivoted from being a biobank and being aware of this problem of the how to assess the tissues and and how to check their quality to solving this problem with digital pathology and offering this as a solution to other biobanks. Yeah, we really appreciate Dennis interviewing us and it's important to get the message out there. So in our process, there are certain things when they get into the biobank or we get access to them, there are in, there's information in there that is from the pathologist, for example, that is in written form or a limb system or HL7 format where they basically have some data on those tissues. But that data isn't really necessarily explicit to research, it's explicit to care. And so there are features in there that we want to know in those tissues. And it starts with this. So if you're building a new diagnostic in your companion diagnostic or a new biomarker, you have an idea from basic research. You've done some samples and you say, okay, I found this very interesting marker. Now I need to get more samples. Let's go to a biobank and get those samples. They come to us and they say, hey, we want these samples with this biomarker on it. We say, okay, we can find those tumors. We can find those formats that you want. And then they say, we want to make sure that there's enough tumor purity tumor material in the block, for example, that allows us to say that we're buying something that we can then test our assay. So what we would do is we, for years, we have a pathologist on staff. That pathologist, we regard very highly because they have to do a lot of work and it's and sometimes it's beyond their daily work that they do for care, but they essentially have to look at every single slide and then they have to annotate what it is the tumor purity on there, how much percent is of that slide by surface area is tumor and how much is necrosis and how much is normal tissue. And this is something that is for a pathologist that goes to school for 12 years, it's just pretty low on their totem their experience. But it's not <laughs> the greatest use of time. And they're the first people to say, we would rather not do this. But for research, you want to know that. You want to know if there is enough DNA in that tissue or RNA to have a successful yeah, test. Yeah, it's a mandatory information. Otherwise, right? if you don't have that, your research can go to the garbage. Go to pieces, right? So we would do that, have our pathologist look at the slide, annotate it, give information by based on surface area. Then we send that block to a farmer, anyone who's used research ready to use it. Then they actually cut their own slide, which is now the next layer down. They stain an HED on it, and then they do their own analysis with their own pathologist. So now we have same competing exercise. opinions about the same thing. Now you're doubling the work. Instead of trusting like this is a confirmed tissue with this percent tumor necrosis, they've doubled the work. And because of their skepticism around these tissues and where they come from and how they've been obtained in their age, they do this anyway. So that was a painful process for us. We could deliver these tissues that they wanted, and then it could take three to six months for them to get their pathology pipeline into a place where they could analyze them. Because as we all know, there's only 1,200 or so of things, pathologists, board certified pathologists serving us. And then if it's a vet path thing, it's even fewer. We basically wanted to remove that situation and for years have been pining about how do we remove this because if they have the sample for 30, 60, 90 days, we're waiting for them to tell us it's right or wrong. And then mm -hmm. some of these tissues are rare enough where whether it's a rare indication or it's a rare access point, like I was saying within the clinical care, or it's got a marker that is 0.5% of all of those cases. So you don't exactly have them as much as cancer is prevalent and horrible. It's not exactly accessible in the way that you want. So we would want to know right away if they want that tissue or not. So that was the impetus for us when we started looking at AI and digital pathology. We said, once you scan that image, we can then do things with 
AI, to count tumor nuclei, to look at percent tumor necrosis by surface area that is done very quickly. And then a pathologist can just say, I agree with that outcome. I agree with what they said. And for, I'm telling you something you already know, but <laughs> for pathologists to count tumor nuclei is a really Give mundane me a task. Break. No. And it's not within the human eyes. It's not a not an ideal situation, but computers do this stuff really well. So we raised the bar by saying, we're not just going to show you by surface area. We're going to show you by tumor nuclei, how much is in there. And what it does is it opens up these tissues that often would be bypassed by percent surface area. And they would open them up and say, this actually has enough tumor nuclei to have reactivity to show that the acid works or to test the assay. And so what you find is in the United States, for example, they have the Food Administration has grading of strawberries, for example. And John Wetzel, my co-founder, likes to give this example. There are strawberries that are perfect that you see in the supermarket and you're like, okay, so that is a perfect strawberry and I will eat that strawberry. But the strawberries that go into jam, that go into jelly, that go into other things are not the most beautiful things, and, but they have utility. And that's what we found about the tissues is the most beautiful tumor tissues don't always mean that they're the best research tissue. It may be that this is a ROS1, which is very rare, 1% of the population, and it's usable. It may be really dense and really small on this by surface area, but it may have enough data there, enough utility there that we can make access that. So we're opening up our biobanks even further now because we can say these tissues are actually usable. We can prove to you they're usable. And we remove that step where we're doubling up the effort to have them see, have them accept the tissue. And what we've done is we did with digital pathology we can show the H and E and a pathologist can zoom in and look at it or a research can zoom in and look at it. They can also see our overlays and they can see the tumor nuclei. They can see the normal and I can show you in the video if you want. Yeah. But basically can, but just to give like a little framework. So you had a biobank and then you decided to introduce digital pathology. And the first level was just scanning your stained H and E's so that the viewing of the specimen is reduced to viewing one and the same specimen by yeah. whichever pathology just wants to view it, right? Yeah. And then the second level is, okay, let's eliminate the manual work of annotations and use image analysis and artificial intelligence-based image analysis to delineate the structures that the pathologist had to do manually previously and then show Correct. this as well so that everybody who's interesting can look at it. And I remember from what you showed me before, it's like a catalog. You can basically pick from a catalog of Correct. the slides that you want to use for your research with all the information information that's available about the slide, right? Very quickly, did you already claim your access to the recordings of the virtual event bridging the gap between computer science and pathology? This is a series of 13 lectures with the top computational pathology scientists from the Radboud University Medical Center in, in the Netherlands. I put it together for you in the form of a digital course. It's absolutely free, has the video and audio recordings as well as the transcript. So no more excuses. Go to the link in the show notes and get your access. Yeah, that's right. When you get into digital pathology, there are companies that are doing the digital pathology supporting digital pathologists. But the value and the utility is that you give the image gives you portability, right? And that's where the world has changed. It's great if you can do digital pathology online and it enables pathologists from all around the world to collaborate. That is absolutely fantastic. And that's the first step. And to me, that's like where there was Lotus Notes one, two, three, and then Microsoft Excel. And it was like, okay, so now we can put these data in data in spreadsheets and we can put this information in. The next level is that portability. Now I can send that to somebody and someone can read that. So that's where we started to use image handling, distribute our network and expand our network of pathologists that can review these things and allow the end user, to, the researcher to see them. The next level is the AI. It's really starting to interrogate these samples and say, what's in these things? And the beauty of the AI is that I can go back and add it later. So we've developed a system where a user can upload an image very easily. It's called Arch. Then you can choose which AIs you want to run on it. And so those AIs can be for research use only, or they can be clinically approved diagnostics or what have you. And we expect more and more of those to come around. But for us, the first part was let's start with quality of the tissue because that supports our business. The next level is starting to look at lymphocytes and starting to look at different markers, PDL one and starting to look at not just the H and E's, but look at the biomarkers that are in immunistic chemistry. So we're building out those apps and adding those ourselves 
But as you know, there's many authors out there that are working on these things. And we actually created a, an enablement within our system so we can actually distribute those images, images their AIs have never seen before, and have pathologists validate very quickly, is this working or not? Do we agree that this AI is working? We also can introduce bad samples of poor quality this way very quickly. And in that process of validating a diagnostic, you not only have to have the statistical power in the perfect sample, you have to have it showing that it has efficacy in all kinds of samples. So we have now the ability with the portability of digital images to give them normals, to give them things that they would need to prove statistically. In fact, not just that AI, but the diagnostic is actually accurate. Yes, we added AIs and we were able to add any AI to our system. The way we structured it in the cloud is that you can call those AIs. And that's where we commercially charge. We don't charge to upload the image or anything, but we do charge to run the AIs. And our business model is almost like cable television where you pay for the, and you get the access to the cable and then you pay for content essentially. And we hope to get Netflix. lots and lots of AIs in there that are validated, whether internally validated or, and what I mean by that is, let's say it's a university or it's the NCI using something internally that say, we want to see if this is biomarker is really effectively being identified by the AI. And there it gets into multimodal spectral imaging, three-dimensional imaging, and all sorts of things where we can then build on our platform to do those types of things. That's a little futuristic. That's where we're looking, but it is where we want to go. In this point, we are able then now to automate these processes. So we actually have it where our system, you can tie your scanner into our system. It'll start to log all the information. And this is where the bio banking comes in. Essentially, it starts the biobanking process where you have your consent reported, you have your pathology reports reported, you have all your data in there, you have the images in there. Now you have a dossier around this biobank material that you can then interrogate over and over again, but you can also distribute it anywhere you want. And we feel that's very powerful, but then you can automate processes where if a company wants to batch those, and let's say that the pathologist isn't available 24 hours, 24 seven, 365, you know, the computers are, and they can run batches mm -hmm. while you're sleeping, the computers run the analysis. Then they show you the results and we can set all sorts of parameters around minimums and maximums and thresholds that say these samples failed our criteria. We would like a pathologist to review those thoroughly, open up the case, look at it, annotate it and give their feedback. These passed no problem. We still need a pathologist mm -hmm. maybe to look at them, but it's not going to be four to 20 minutes a slide. It's going yeah, to be, gonna be yes, instant I, approval rather than yeah. sorting out what went wrong. Yeah, so we furnished the data to them. The pathologist looks at it and said, I agree with that. They press a button, their signature is then tied to that, and it says, that is, I agree with that outcome. And it makes the throughput a lot faster, especially if you're trying to test a lot of material, it makes that throughput a lot faster. Now we're chipping away at that time that it takes to find samples. We're able to aggregate samples from all over the world in certain indications very quickly, and we're chipping away at that time that takes 12 years to get a companion diagnostic or more for a therapeutic, right? That's where digital pathology really, we decided that we wouldn't play in the area of trying to reproduce what pathologists do online, but we will enable, we will use AI to enable people to take out the mundane, the stuff that people don't want to do, that computers do well, and then just show people results and let them make an assessment of what happens. And so that you're able to then move that on to automation and notify people of batches and things like that. But also, again, we can use the Internet of Things to access different devices in the laboratory. And now those things become, that workflow becomes completely automated where humans aren't touching slides and bringing it to the next person. Here's the pathologist, the pathologist then just does things. We actually have it so that it can really automate. And we have it, we're to the point where the AI can circle the area, the region of interest on, a, on an H&E, which is done manually now by a pathologist, right? They hold up, they see the area they say that looks like the most tumor we'll circle that and then we'll hand it off to the laboratory to scrape those and put those in tubes for dissociation well, now we have it where we can print out a report either electronically or on a piece of paper that's validated and essentially put that slide down and they could scrape their material and put it in tubes and so that helps take the burden of manually circling things, choosing areas where the tumor is most dense. And a subsequent step to that is that we actually have robots that we can call that can punch those areas of highest tumor oh, density. I, guess I want to talk about and, the robots. And put let's, them in the tubes. <laughs> so yeah. we said digitization as the super very first step so that everybody can look at the same time. We have AI yeah. for different whatever you can use image analysis slash AI for, yeah. and you have infrastructure for AI. AI suppliers, let's say image analysis companies, to plug in into your image management system, which is going to be the third thing. So you guys are like an, a hub where people, regardless of their needs, can plug in with whatever they have.
love. And you now mentioned Internet of Things and trying to remote in or connect with external devices and your yeah. robots. I can show a video. This is essentially an ovarian tumor tissue that we run our AIs on. And we put this technology using this application as Visio Farm based that we develop mm -hmm. them. And Feel um, free to talk about the partners that you have. We want to know the names of people who okay. are working with you because we want to spread the word about everybody that can basically integrate with what you guys have. Yeah, absolutely. So we chose Visio Farm because they have 20 years experience in AI and we tested them against other systems about the how accurate the ground truths are, how they make adjustments to different images and things like that. And we felt that they were, that's where we wanted to start. Again, we can use AI from anywhere essentially mm -hmm. as long as we our pathologists can validate the accuracy of them and like you said there can be things like let's say you have prostate samples and you want to just have the Gleason score the Gleason score is not in the pathology report but it's in another report we can go back and run A and Gleason score these very quickly so that we know that they fit the criteria of that study which we have to keep in mind basically it runs through and it looks green in this case is normal it's from a, there's actually it's not just showing green as if it's not tumor there is actually calculations based on the the cellular structure and the pathology there to say that is actually normal. The red in this case is necrosis. You can see this, this sample is actually a pretty good one, a lot of necrosis. And the purplish blue is really the tumor. And what we're, we're able to do, it. so you can see here, now we show the tumor grows densely in certain tumor tissues. And I'm not going to tell pathologists what I see here, but essentially, uh, Alex, these outlines then become very useful. And if you were doing micro dissection, but what we were able to do is we can verify in these tissues that these in fact are tumor nuclei in the pinkish purple ones. And then the bluish ones are essentially normal nuclei. So we count those and we're able to show that this tumor has 46,509 nuclei, which is plenty for most genomic profiling tests, DNA, RNA, even good, plenty for IHC. This is a good example of a tissue. I could show you a tissue that has a very small micro dot of tumor, but is actually, in fact, highly usable as a marker on it. Mm -hmm. It's 55% tumor nuclei, so that's pretty high. But now you see we did a heat map, so we know where the tumor is densest, and this is based on the physical distribution of tumor nuclei where it's densest. And so then we're able to really start to identify where we would punch this, whether we're doing a tissue microarray or we're doing something for DNA testing. And so we then have so you collaborated can exactly with... go to the high density area marked in red and have your cores taken out from there. That's exactly right. Or cores and, and... scraped or whatever your robots are doing. That's right. And one of the reasons we chose VisioPharm is because they essentially, we keep an XY coordinate of every nuclei. So we know if you punch one area because you feel that it has the highest density, you still have, in this case, you have four other areas you could punch later on. But we know where all the nuclei are so we can map those out. And that's what generates the position so of the robot. So you keep, you trace the use of your sample as well. Yes. So yeah. you could basically service, let's say we have five circles where it could be punched. You could service five clients with this one sample rather than selling the whole thing to somebody who's just going to use part of it. Yeah. So we, we can, what we call syndicate this block so that there are more researchers doing more research, having access to, like you said, if this were, a, this is a variant, but if it were a ROS1, for example, and you say, we only have so many of those, now let's let's try to make it so that more people have access to the research. And part and parcel of that is if it's internal, you can always go back and now you have other studies that you can do simultaneously. And being in the business for 20 years, essentially, for acquiring samples, one of the problems is that you don't, we see these studies come around. We have a view on the world with pharma and diagnostics where we see the study come back around every so often. There's a publication and they dust off those studies and they say, we got to go into that space. And that is really inefficient from a development perspective, right? Is if you didn't have the samples and you didn't have some evidence and some progress in that study, they'll table that study. New CEO comes in and he or she says, we're going to focus on these areas. And then you table all the research. And so there's a lot of research that's idle and a lot of programs that actually come out years later to be essentially worthwhile. Every four years, we see them turn over and say, we're not going to do that study anymore we had such a hard time getting the samples and that researcher may have four or five studies going simultaneously because they don't have enough samples to prove and enough science done to prove to the next level that they should continue to pursue that and invest in that area. So being able to go back to these tissues, reuse them, reinterrogate them. Now you always have the digital image. It goes back again. That original image is great because you always go back and interrogate that and say, what did I see there? And that's where multiplexing and different layers of information start to build. And then you continue to build that, what I call a dossier about that a file about that particular tissue that gives it real information over time. And if you're doing safety talks or you're doing something where you want to go back and say, I want to see what this tissue looked like pre, post or whatever, that becomes really has a lot of utility. And for years,
years, a lot of this stuff gets stored in basements or in biobanks and you never see them again. And then you say, Alex, do you remember when we did this safety talk study on these the, the, for this therapy or even something as simple as like silver or things that the FDA requires you to show? You're like, no, I think John has that file. Yeah. It's really not efficient in that way. So that's a um, big pain point in drug development research in general. And now we have systems before we didn't even have systems. And now we have some <laughs> systems. Now we need some awareness. We need to make aware make people aware of that you do need image management system for digital pathology. It's no more a couple of folders worth of slides. It gets out of control so quickly. And if you want to interrogate this data in any way, you need software for that. Yeah. And we've come a long way, but this is the beginning of that, being able to stack this data and look at it holistically. And I think that's, again, we're chipping away at the inefficiencies of limitations that were just technologically being on paper or being Excel spreadsheets and being able to bring this to light and deliver it in a way that is meaningful for research and, and development, right? Definitely. And I think in digital pathology world, there is no discussion if you need a scanner or not, right? If you want to do it at scale, everybody's going to get the scanner. But still, all the other things like maybe image analysis, but maybe not. Maybe image management system, but maybe not. Maybe integration with something, but maybe not. It's yeah. No more, maybe not. You have to do it if you want to reap all the benefits of what's possible. Scanning is just the first step. And I think slowly we're starting to realize that. And like in any discipline, any area of biotech, of life sciences, first everybody starts working on their own in their little silos. And then slowly they start coming together. And you guys are a super example of all those developments coming together and deploying it for others to benefit with business strategy in mind because if money does not follow those developments, then they're not going to be distributed and they're not going to be used. Yeah, they fail essentially. And that's, you know, comment, you asked a question earlier and comment on funding and getting from mm -hmm. research into development and stuff like that. We're very passionate about samples. It's not the only thing that limits research and development, but it definitely gates the progress that happens in there. And so when you talk about money and how much money it takes to do something and getting money to flow, you, know, you really need to have results and results come from being able to do research. And like I said, I know lots of very smart researchers in pharma and diagnostics that just impress me every day what they do. But at the same time, they can't make progress. And so why does a therapy cost billions of dollars? It costs billions of dollars because they have to do a lot in between stage three and stage four development that is not being done in the initial rounds to prove that it's actually good. And so the cohorts are small in the beginning. Those areas are underfunded. And that's why you have things like in the United States, it's the NCI. They do a lot of great work and they're trying to do more with tech transfer to get that going and fund it. But, but there's a handoff there. In academia, there's actually tons and tons of good work being done, but it's up to those tech transfer offices to notify people of what's happening. And a lot of times you'll see that the statistical value that they have in their studies and their study designs are very weak. And a lot of that, it comes from they weren't able to access the patient to get those. So if you have to prove it in a subset of 12, maybe that's doable. But if you really have to start to prove it in somewhere there where the statistical power becomes interesting, that doesn't happen and they get caught up in this web. And so, again, they raise more money. They try to raise more money on the proof that they have. And, and then it becomes more of a, you know, how interested it is the person who has the first strings and taking it to the next level. We hope that we can get more of this information out. Because like I said, 20 years ago or longer, we had some of these therapeutics targets that are now just emerging. And for future generations, we hope we can do this a little bit better and a little faster. We've been behind a lot of novel diagnostics, ALK and different things like that. Our samples mm -hmm. have been supplied to those people that drive those innovations and immunotherapy. And we're very proud of that, but it's taken a long time. John and Phil both lost their hair over this process. So you I mean, didn't. I, I, I did. <laughs> Someone had to lose it. But so we try to empower this. And our technology is made in the cloud so that people can access it. So that people with one doctor, one PhD, one whomever who's starting to look at these can upload their images essentially for free. There's no setup cost. There's no get a scan, but we have partners that can scan those images if they don't have a scanner in house. We can subsidize those scanners so that they pay over time so there's not a huge lift to get those in. We allow them to get that first part, which you pointed out, was to get the digital scan. And then subsequent to that, it's analysis 
for a regular person to do what we've done up to this point is $99, which not everyone has access to a great pathologist. I live outside of Boston. There are so many biotechs, it's amazing. They can't all hire the same pathologist because there are only so many pathologists. So we try to empower them. We have in Paul, we do have partners with partnerships with pathologists that can help with research that are board certified. They're allowed to do research support, but we try to enable them as quickly as possible, as low a price as possible to get them to do that. Now, if you're a big company and you're going to do thousands of these or you're a genomic profiling company, this is where this automation comes in big because you're waiting. Let's say a pathologist works an eight hour shift. You know, what happens the other hours of the day and those tests accumulate and you really get reimbursed on the pathologist giving a diagnosis at the end of the day or making a call on a test. That's where the value is. So we let the machines do all that. That's mm -hmm. where this robot comes in and I'll show you that right now. It's yeah, basically we, part we partner with a company called Isanet out of Italy and these gentlemen essentially built, yeah, Looking so the Isanet has a really great technology called Galileo Thematic. We joined forces with them to automate the process of punching the tissues. Now their original robot was for TMAs, which is great, but we did it for DNA and RNA extraction and hopefully there are future tests that go this way too. But you can see it can take different formats of FFP blocks. And we've already scanned the images upstream and run our AI and then delivered that through Visio Farms AI, which we put in the web. We punched, posted it on Amazon. To the so robot and the robot knows when where to punch those blocks. Exactly. That and is so puts, cool. And then we actually have it so that if you have certain ro other robots, it will pull that tray. Hamilton robots. Yeah, Hamilton robots in this case, it'll put it into the dissociation and those two tubes are filled and already starting the process of getting the DNA ready to be sequenced. So we're getting away at these workflows so that the human doesn't have to handle them as much. That doesn't mean that people are going to be let go from their jobs. It just means they can do more. And They can know. shift their energy and expertise into those places where the machine cannot help us. And I am starting to see this as a trend where the manual digital pathology workflow is being shifted to the automated one because we can totally can do it and we should do it. Yeah. There is no reason to have more overhead for digital pathology workflow than we had for a normal pathology lab. So Leif, before we go and before we tell everyone where to find you online, if you can tell us, list all the people that can work with you, like who <laughs> can do business with you, who do you do business with? Yes. Like different parties that can be involved with you and how? We built this using salesforce.com. So we built it on that platform because that is, it's a misnomer. It's not just for sales, it's for, they used to rebrand it as force because it handles all the data that comes with this. So your account down to your sub-user account. So that allowed us to do certain things. One is that we're HIPAA compliant. We mm -hmm. also have national security agency level security on it. We are GDPR compliant. So we can service anyone in the world. And there are people that are in countries with few pathologists that we can service those people too. And so we put it in the cloud and then we moved the Visio Farm software from being hosted locally to be hosted in the cloud on Amazon Web Server. Mm -hmm. That allows us to distribute and scale these services anywhere in the world. So we can not only put it in a certain language, we can not only secure for privacy, but we can actually distribute that information, localize that information and scale up those servers. So if you had one day you had 10 samples and the next day you had 3000 samples, it knows to scale up those servers so that it's not like adding one pathologist, it's like adding enough pathologists to push that information through. What that means is we can service one person doing research that's an academic or in a small biotech. We can service people that are in large biotech, medium biotech, any size. We can service the, we have it on GovCloud. We can actually do it for the NCI, the NIH, and those institutions that require a government pardoned security system. We have it so that new molecular profiling companies, life sciences companies that have new platforms, anyone. We can do animal companies. We can do companies that are veterinary practices that are with everyday pets. I mean, we can do anything that comes with preclinical. So the way we built it was to be as encompassing and welcoming as possible, basically. You can set up these accounts, I can set security for you and your subordinates or you and your peers. And I can log those things and I can show those logs when people access them. And really it's meant to be for, to expand our horizon because one of the problems in we do in biobanking is I have a great biobanking of white people, but I don't have representative populations throughout the world. We're not just making drugs for one person. We're making drugs for yeah, and cancers that's that affect everyone. Known problem in healthcare in general and all the studies and all the research we just do 
do research on a certain subpopulation and yeah. mostly it's a white male and yeah. that's not all the people in the world but no, like, they're, if, they're, no there are some other people it's true well. more women than men right so let's be honest so, about it. Also, so okay just like to simplify it super simplify what <laughs> do you guys sell if i go what do i buy from you do i buy the samples do i buy the data with samples and like samples with all the information it's not clear for me like i can upload my samples what do i then buy from you the output of an ai algorithm there are a couple of different things that i could give you money for what do i buy from you yeah so there's three pillars to this one is the mm -hmm. ice right you can buy ais from us run your own images and those you just pay a fee for those you can buy the ma sample material too that is blocks if you need those research you can buy the slides if you need those you can buy mm -hmm. immunized to chemistry services on those slides you can buy different things so we have a partner with a laboratory that allows us to stain and do all the molecular profiling that we want to do on those tissues so that when you get it, it's got the characterization you want and mm -hmm. you've got the image. You can also buy the images and license those images so that you can do your own AI. We partner with Visio Farm not only for hosting what we want to do, but they part we can allow them to install the authoring tools so that you can author your own AI. So you can buy those images to start to do your own training AIs. That's all in what's called a marketplace. And the marketplace is mm -hmm. just transactional, right? You can sell, buy and sell anything through that marketplace. Suppliers can put their images and their things in there for other people to buy. And buyers can come in and buy those things that support their research. Then once they buy the AIs, they can buy storage space. And further that, then there's a separate product called LabFlow that they can buy the laboratory workflow that allows them to automate these steps to mm -hmm. in their laboratory. So that it's as much hands-free digital handling as possible. And that comes as a user base. So you buy user you subscriptions. Like everything. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately for us, we have so much experience with this that we knew we couldn't just do one thing in order to achieve mm -hmm. our goal. We had to do a number of things. So we built these three pillars, which is the AI, the marketplace, and then the automation. And the automation, mm -hmm. you can buy the instrument through Isnet. We can buy that instrument so you can we can put in the automation and the robot so you can that ties into the lab flow, which ties into the marketplace system. So there's a lot you can buy from us to say the least, but what you find is when you talk to someone who's doing digital pathology, the lights go on and they're like, okay, so now that we've committed yeah, to digital need, pathology, what else It's not that you just need do? one thing. You can compartmentalize and you can do incremental if you want to reap all the benefits, which is when the cost justification is actually happening, where you can justify you need more than just one step. Totally yeah. possible to go incremental uh, to check if it's working for you. When you decide to deploy and uh, gain all the benefits, then you have to go all in. That's at least what I'm seeing in the industry. And if you can partner with somebody who has experience with that and you can learn from their mistakes, that's a big advantage because mistakes cost a lot in healthcare. Yes, this is so true. We partner with limb systems. We have APIs to limb systems. We have partnerships it's with perfect. image handling systems that are already in place, like ProSha and, the, and folks like that, where they already have some handling in there. They're doing traditional pathology, but we put in this infrastructure. And the way we built it is you can increase incrementally add as you go. You don't have to buy the whole shooting match. And that was one of the problems. Even implementing printing systems in the United States, for example, it was like, okay, buy this IBM machine. And then 10 years later, you can buy a new IBM machine. And it's this, we think things are moving so fast in the imaging side and the scanning side of things that you don't want to put a lot of money into that. So we have a replacement system where we can place those imaging handling systems and scale them up. And what we want to do is have a low barrier to entry. So anyone can sign in and start to do this stuff, low fees so that lots of people can do it. And then just have lots and lots of capabilities that then grow them into what we believe the future is, which is people like Path AI and Page AI have diagnostics that are interesting and mm -hmm. deploy those on this system when they're ready. So that it's an end-to-end -end system and, uh, and hopefully I was able to articulate it relatively clearly for you. So Leif, where do we find you online? When people want to go and buy stuff from you and engage yeah. in this digital pathology journey, where do they find you? Yeah, so www.trimetis, T-R-I-M-E-T-I-S, ls as in life sciences.com and then if you click on the arch system arch it's the acronym for abbreviation for accelerating research changing healthcare and click on there create an account it only takes a couple minutes you only have a SaaS agreement to get in there and then depending on what you want to do if you want to buy services or you just want to peruse it's all there and then that's it that's all there is to it okay thank you so much for joining us and for letting us know about you and i hope yeah. you have a great day thank you you as well appreciate the time Alex. 
We tried to pack a lot into this episode, and I know you might be a little overwhelmed with the breadth of services that Trimetis is offering and with all the things that you actually have to do to be able to leverage the power of digital pathology. And it's not insignificant. You can start small, but to leverage the full power, you would have to go all in. So be sure to check the website and reach out to them if you think there is an area of overlap where you could work together. Thanks so much for staying till the end. I know those of you who are staying till the end are my real digital pathology trailblazers. And before we go on with our day, I just wanted to let you know that I recently prepared a new free resource for you. It's called Digital Pathology Starter Kit. It's a bundle of curated Digital Pathology Place resources, a few podcasts, videos, and blog posts that will help you jumpstart your digital pathology journey. If you're further along in your journey, you probably already grabbed the Bridging the Gap course. But if you're just beginning, you want to systematize your knowledge or you know somebody who would benefit from this starter kit, the link is going to be in the show notes. And I talk to you in the next episode.